Next talk is SSL in the Future of Authenticity by Moxie Marlinspike. So please give a warm welcome to Moxie. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name is Moxie Marlinspike. I am a fellow at the Institute for Disruptive Studies and the co-founder and CTO of Whisper Systems. Um, all right. So when giving talks like this, there's, there's a well-known problem, which is that at the beginning of the talk, not everyone's really here yet. You know, some people are still coming in. You know, people see each other in the hallway. You know, Black Hat's a big place and it's all spread out. So uh, normally, I feel like what speakers do is try and you know spend uh, the first three minutes of the talk, you know, giving a long bio or uh, you know some extensive tedious background uh, on uh, the the talk they're about to give. Um, but you know, I want to lead strong. So I thought instead of doing that, I'm just going to try something totally different. And I'm going to tell, for the next three minutes, I'm just going to tell a completely unrelated story that has nothing to do with computer security, just so we can kill some time here. OK, it goes like this. Just after I'd gotten out of high school, uh, some friends and I had this really harebrained scheme where we were going to uh, find some uninhabited island in the Caribbean and like colonize it. Uh, so I blame this idiocy on my youth. Uh, but uh, so we actually drove all the way to Miami because this, you know, we were broke. And back then, driving was cheaper than flying uh, before getting on a plane into the Caribbean. And um, the whole thing didn't work out, obviously, uh, which is a whole other story. But we were very hungry. Um, and uh, so when you know, we, were, we were, uh, came back to Florida, we were driving back north through Florida you know, in defeat. And, um, at some point, we decided to stop and have lunch. And we, we pulled over, and we actually wanted to you know, like get out of the car for a second. We found one of these like, Tex-Mex type restaurants. You, know, you sit down, and they have chips and stuff like that. Um, and so we, you know, we went in there. And uh, just uh, you know, th it was me and two buddies. And we all got out of the car at the same time and started walking towards the restaurant. And about halfway there, one of my friends realized that uh, he'd left something in the car or that he'd forgotten to lock it or something. So he turned around. And he went back to the car, and me and my other friend kept going in the restaurant. And just as we got in the restaurant, we caught the very end of their birthday ritual. So I feel like every restaurant um, you know, of this caliber has its own like, weird birthday ritual. You know, they sing a little song or something a little different, try and make it fun. So we caught the end of this one. And it was the strangest thing that I've ever seen in a restaurant to this day. You know, these waiters come out singing. Uh, and uh, one of them you know, stands in front of this lady whose birthday it is with a little like, saucer plate full of whipped cream on it, uh, just like a little dab of whipped cream on the saucer plate with a spoon uh, and held it in front of her as if to feed her the whipped cream and asked her to close her eyes and open her mouth. So she closes her eyes, open her mouth, and meanwhile, standing behind her, there's another waiter with a full pie tin of whipped cream and she closes her eyes, and he reaches around and slams it in her face. <laughs> just covers her in whipped cream. You know, and this lady's shocked, right? You know, it's her birthday. What if she's all dressed up? And sitting there, she just got slammed in the face with a pot. And so my friend and I are standing there just like, what? Did you just see that? You know? And so my friend looks at me, and my other friend's still out of the car. <laughs> and he says, I think it might be Jack's birthday today. <laughs> So by the time he gets in, this lady's all cleaned up. She's gone to the bathroom, all this stuff, whatever. So we sit down, and I surreptitiously, you know, during the meal, go and find the waiter. I'm like, dude, it's our buddy's birthday. You know, I don't know if you guys do anything here for birthdays. No. And, and he's, like, he's like, no, no, we do something. We got a thing. You know? And I was like, all right, bring it on. You know? And uh, so they came out singing and all this stuff. You know? And our friend is like, kind of bewildered. You know, this is all happening on our table, right? And later he confesses that he thought that we would told them it was his birthday so that we could get like, free cake. You know. And so you know, he's playing along, and they, they put like a paper hat on him, and they do the exact same thing, where they hold out the little thing of whipped cream with the spoon, you know, and there's a guy, <laughs> guy behind him with a tin of whipped cream, and just reaches around, slams him in the face. And I had um, one of those disposable cameras you know, back then. You would you'd film cameras. You'd get uh, developed at Walgreens. And so I knew this was happening, so I had it like, already under the, the table, and I got him just <laughs> after the moment. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> So the look on his face is just pure shock. You know? <laughs> anyway, OK. Uh, hopefully, that was more entertaining than my bio. 
Okay, so I want to I want to spend some time talking about SSL authenticity, and really this is a talk about trust. And uh, I want to start this off uh, with another story. Uh, it's kind of a downer, but I feel like it's um, illustrative of the situation that we're in today. And the, the story is about this company called Komodo. Uh, Komodo is the, according to Netcraft, the second largest certificate authority in the world. They certify uh, somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of the SSL sites on the internet. And in March of this year, they got hacked. Um, the attacker was able to make uh, off with some certificates, uh, mail.google.com, yahoo.com, login.live.com, Skype. Uh, basically, um, everything that you would need to intercept uh, communication to like logins and passwords for the popular uh, webmail providers and things like that. Um, and immediately after the attack, the um, founder and CEO of the company issued a statement where he said, this attack was extremely sophisticated and critically executed. It was very well orchestrated, a very clinical attack, and the attacker knew exactly what they needed to do and how fast they had to operate. He went on to say that all of the IPs involved in the attack were from Iran, which you know what that means, cyber. But he, he didn't leave it at that. Uh, he didn't leave it in innuendo. He actually spelled it out. Uh, he said, all, the, all of the above leads us to one conclusion only, that this was likely to be a state-driven attack. So he's painting a, a pretty complete picture for us here, right? This isn't just a hack. Uh, this is war. And who is to blame Komodo for falling under the full weight of the assaults of a nation state, you know, invading some foreign territory, right? Um, so ironically enough, it was these statements that really catapulted this event uh, in, out of the trade press into the mainstream media. And a number of reporters um, called me after this had happened, and they all had similar questions. You know, the first one was, well, what does this mean? And I would say, well, it means you know, whoever has these certificates can now intercept secure communication for these websites. Uh, and then you know, some of them say, well, how? How would they use them? And you know, I would say, well, you know, I think there's some commercial solutions. There's like blue code and stuff like that. You can these you know, surveillance devices. Um, and, and, and the one person said, well, no, 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 what is the easiest way to use these certificates? Like, what is the most straightforward thing that you could do, no cost, you know? And I thought about it, and I said, well, you, you could just use SSL sniff, uh, which is a tool that I wrote to form man-in-the-middle attacks against uh, SSL connections. And really, it's perfect. You just, you know, plug these certificates in, and bam, you get all the secure communication to those sites. And so... Um, Komodo did something a little bit unusual, which is they published the IP address of the attacker. Um, and I think that this was to fully underscore, you know, Iran, 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 because, um, you know, it was registered to an IP block in Iran. Uh, and so after talking to this reporter, I was SSL sniff, and kind of thought about it, I said, well, I wonder. So I went and I looked in my web logs uh, for my web server. And sure enough, the day after the attack, uh, the IP address that Komodo posted downloaded SSL sniff from my website. <laughs> and so, you know, a couple of interesting uh, features here. One, they run Windows. <laughs> Two, their browser is localized to US English. Hmm. But the most interesting thing of all was the referrer. So I went a little bit further back in my web logs to find the initial point that they contacted my web server so I could see the site that they visited before, which was a Hack5 video <laughs> on intercepting secure communication. So just to break it down, on one hand, we have the CEO of Komodo. <laughs> Very well orchestrated, clinical. Maybe this video was really good. I don't know. I haven't watched it yet. Maybe it turned them into clinical attackers. But from what I see, you know, on one hand, we have these statements. And on the other hand, you know, we have someone who's literally following video tutorials on the internet designed for you know, introductory material to these topics. Uh, and then there was a number of other really embarrassing referrers that um, you know, appeared throughout the day. Uh, you, know, you could see their, their Google search terms. It was like SSL protocol, man in the middle, how to IP tables, pre-routing. Apparently, was having some trouble with his IP table set up, uh, getting that going. Um, and then, so I'm kind of chuckling to myself about all this, and, uh, and then he posted a communique, and it could not have been more embarrassing for anybody, you know. 
Uh, on one hand, he's making these ridiculous claims about, you know, he can hack RSA and all this stuff. And then on the other hand, he's like simultaneously very proudly talking about how he can do trivial things like, you know, create his own SOAP APIs and export functions from DLLs, right? Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, this, this could not have been more embarrassing. But then, and to make matters worse, he just wouldn't shut up. He just kept posting communiques, and each more ridiculous than, than the previous one. Uh, so this, yeah, this could not have looked worse for Komodo. And so the Komodo CEO responded to all of this by issuing a statement where he said, if there were a secure and trusted DNS, this issue would be a moot point, exclamation point. We need a secure and trusted DNS, exclamation point. Uh, so he has just very enthusiastically declared that he does not understand the business that he's in. <laughs> on one hand, he seems to imply that the only way to perform a man-in-the-middle attack is through DNS tampering, which is just not true. And on the other hand, he's saying if there were no way to perform a man-in-the-middle attack, then it wouldn't matter that these certificates got stolen. I'm not sure that he realizes that the reason we have SSL certificates is because it's possible to perform man-in-the-middle attacks. If it weren't, we wouldn't need the certificates that he's selling us. <laughs> so anyway, this is the guy securing a quarter of the internet. Um, later that month, they got hacked twice more, and then a month later, they got hacked again. So, you know, this all looks pretty bad, right? And normally, I wouldn't spend, you know, this much time being this critical about a company like Komodo. But I think that it's a, it's a good story because uh, it, illust it il illustrates an important point uh, which is that, you know, after all of this, it couldn't have been worse, couldn't have been more embarrassing, uh, you know, couldn't have been more severe. And what happened to Komodo? Nothing. Their business didn't suffer, they didn't lose customers, they didn't get sued, no nothing happened to them. In fact, the only thing that happened to Komodo this year was that the CEO was named Entrepreneur of the Year <laughs> at RSA. And so I feel like this, this, this is the problem that we're dealing with. This, this one story really illustrates uh, the problem that we have today very well. So let's take a moment and just back up and, and look in general at what a secure protocol is, um, this thing, SSL. So any secure protocol ne needs to provide three things, secrecy, integrity, and authenticity. You gotta have all three. If one of these breaks, the whole protocol falls apart. Um, and so this is what SSL needs to provide. But you have to remember that SSL was developed in the early 90s. Um, that was a long time ago. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information available on how to develop a secure protocol at that time. Um, you know, applied cryptography hadn't been published. I mean, if you wanted to use RSA, the algorithm, you had to license it because it was patented. You had to license the patent from the company, RSA. It cost money to use RSA in your product. Um, you know, there were no books on how to design secure protocols, all the things that we know today. Provable security didn't exist yet. Um, there was also no such thing as e-commerce. The, the, the notion of transmitting a credit card number over the internet uh, didn't really exist. Uh, there were really no web applications. Even the notion of transmitting, uh, you know, your user credentials, uh, you know, a password over the internet was, a, was a pretty foreign. And the internet itself was tiny. Um, at the time, according to ISC, there were less than five million hosts on the internet. You know, compare that to today, where we're about to run out of IP addresses for publicly facing hosts at, at four billion. Uh, so really, when you think about it, you know, when SSL was designed, there were probably less than 10 sites that you could think of in the world that you would want to be secure for some reason, you know, that for some reason you would want the communication with these sites to even be encrypted. Whereas today, there are over 2 million certificates on the internet. And ideally, we'd like all sites to be secure. Uh, also, you know, SSL was developed at Netscape, and this was during a time where there was a lot of intense pressure um, you know, happening within that company. Like, the race was on. This is the place where a series of 4 a.m. decisions gave us JavaScript. <laughs> and we're still dealing with that today. So, you know, while, while these efforts are actually pretty heroic, um, and, you know, the majority of the protocol has, you know, it's had problems over the years, but it's actually done pretty well, you know. Um, you know, they did okay with secrecy and integrity. There, you know, things have come up and there's still problems, but uh, it's really authenticity that has always caused a little bit of friction and is now causing real problems. Now, the reason that authenticity is important in a protocol is because of uh, man-in-the-middle attacks. So normally, you know, if you're negotiating a, sec a secure connection with the server, uh, the problem is that you want to know that you're really talking to the server. You know, otherwise, someone could have intercepted your connection and negotiate a secure session with you and 
make a secure session with a server and then just shuttle data back and forth. Um, classic man in the middle attack. But the thing to remember is that uh, at the time that SSL was developed, this type of attack was entirely theoretical. You know, the, the network tools didn't exist yet. This wasn't the kind of thing that was, was actually uh, happening and it, with any consistency or that had ever happened, you know? This is the kind of thing where it was like, oh, well, there's this one thing called the man in the middle attack. Um, and so the solution that they came up with was called, you know, certificates and certificate authorities. You know, each site issues a certificate when you connect to it, and you know that it's valid because it's signed by a certificate authority. So, you know, in preparing for this talk, I had this thesis that, or, you know, this hypothesis that, um, you know, that this was a different world at the time and everything, and that we've outgrown the circumstances in which SSL was originally imagined. And uh, so I thought, well, I wonder if that's true. And I thought, well, I should ask the people that designed it. And so, uh, you know, I did a little bit of research, and I talked to some people at, uh, at Mozilla now uh, who uh, helped me out, and eventually I figured out that SSL was designed by this guy, Kip Hickman, and um, so I went looking for him, and the, the last thing that he posted to the internet was in 1995. But uh, I managed to track him down, and I, uh, I basically cold called him. And, uh, you know, we, we talked on the phone for a while, he's a great guy, and, uh, you know, he was, like, he was like, SSL, yeah, I haven't thought about that in a long time. Uh, and uh, and it, was, it was amazing, man. I was talking to him, and I, so I was like, okay, certificate authorities, what's the deal? You know? And he was like, oh, that whole authenticity thing, yeah. He's like, I tell you, we just threw that in at the end. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, yeah, I mean, you know, SSL, it was, we were really designing it to prevent passive attacks. That whole man in the middle thing, someone told us about that, and, you know, we just kind of threw that thing in the end. You know, he's like, really, that whole certificate authority thing, it was a bit of a hand wave. Um, which was amazing. <laughs> um, so, and, and, you know, really, you can see how the idea makes sense, right? You know, back in 94 when, you know, this graph of uh, domains on the internet is approaching zero, um, and, you know, there are only a few sites that you can think of that you want to be secure, it makes sense that, hey, you know, we have a few secure sites, we have one organization that looks at them really carefully, makes sure that, uh, you know, this is the right certificate and signs it. But, you know, over time, you know, now we're looking at almost a billion domain names, and ideally we'd want all of them to be secure. And it seems, you know, not entirely realistic that an organization or even a set of organizations are going to be able to look at all of these sites as carefully as they need to in order to certify them. Um, and, you know, Ivan Ristik has put together this nice uh, threat model, and, and history kind of uh, bears, bears this out, right? You know, like up here in, in this corner, you see some of the problems that have happened with integrity and secrecy and SSL, but it hasn't really caused, you know, very severe problems yet. You know, down here you see some of the user limitations. You know, these are things like SSL strip uh, that, that is uh, kind of on the user end. But really up here with all the authenticity stuff is where all the real problems within the protocol itself um, have emerged. And so I think that the real story here this, with this whole Komodo thing wasn't that this was cyber war. You know, I think the real story is that this is happening every day. You know, one of these domains that the attacker got, login.live.com, I mean, I think we should remember that Mike Zussman got that same d certificate and he just asked for it. You know, he didn't export d functions from DLLs or create his own SOAP APIs or hack RSA or whatever this guy said he did, you know. He just, he just signed up for it. Um, you know, Eddie Nig got Mozilla.com with no validation at all. Uh, VeriSign uh, issued a code signing certificate to Microsoft Corporation uh, to attackers that are still unknown. They were never identified. And, I mean, this thing happens all the time. Recently, I was trying to buy an SSL certificate, and so I thought, well, straight to the bottom of the barrel. And I went to SSLinabox.com, and, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing where you have to create an account and before you can get a certificate. And when I went to hit the Create button, it just logged me into someone else's account. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, damn, I'm not trying to hack anybody. I just want the certificate, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, I logged out, and then I, you know, went and re refilled the Create thing and hit it, and it logged me into someone else's account. Every time I did it, I got a different account. You know, it's like, and the thing is, I didn't even bother emailing them because I don't think they even care. You know, this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. And these people, this is a certificate authority that posted the private key for their certificate in the public directory of their web server. And you know, the, the kind of, you know, it's like maybe, maybe you could understand. Well, maybe, I, maybe you could understand how someone would make this mistake, right? But they haven't corrected it. It's still in there. <laughs> you know, since 2009. Uh, 
uh, you know, Starcom was recently hacked. And really, you know, you don't even have to hack anybody. Um, if you want a CA certificate, you can just buy one. You know, call up GeoTrust, and they'll sell you a GeoRoot, an intermediate CA that you can, you can use to intercept any communication on the internet, uh, as long as you promise not to do that. <laughs> I, I really like the iconography, too. It's like, you know, it really is like the key to the world. And so, okay, about these Komodo attacks, what if they were state-sponsored, right? I mean, I think the important thing to, re to remember here is that um, even if Iran were behind this, which I think at this point they pretty clearly were not, um, the only reason they would have to do this is because they don't have a certificate authority of their own. Many other countries do. You know, the EFF uh, put together an excellent project called the SSL Observatory. Where they scan the internet, and uh, they put together a list of all the countries uh, in the world that are capable of signing certificates and thus intercepting all secure communication. Uh, this is, so this is the map of the countries in the world. I don't know if you can tell, but in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a little speck there, and that's Bermuda. Bermuda can sign certificates. What? Oh, no. It's my bad. Uh, <laughs> So the good news is that um, I feel like the vibe has been shifting. Um, you know, the, the vibe that people have about these things has been shifting from total ripoff, which I think is the old vibe, <laughs> to total ripoff and mostly worthless. At this point, <laughs> people seem to agree that uh, you know this is not working out. Um, but so there's been a lot of talk about replacing certificate authorities and replacing the authenticity piece of SSL. But I think it's important that we accurately define the problem uh, before we implement something else uh, just so that we don't make the same mistakes. Um, so the EFF uh, SSL Observatory Project put together this map of all the organizations in the world which are capable of signing certificates. And it's a lot of organizations. Um, in fact, it's 650 different organizations that are currently capable of signing certificates. And so when thinking, you know, like, what's the problem here? Uh, one, I think, simplistic reaction is just to say, well, there's too many of them. There's too many certificate authorities. What we need are fewer certificate authorities. But remember when there was only one? And they could do and charge as much as they wanted? That didn't really feel like it was that much better to me. And if part of the problem here is that we've gone from you know, 20 secure sites to 2 million secure sites, and ideally a billion, it also seems a little unrealistic that uh, you know, one or fewer organizations are going to be able to keep up with this problem uh, more accurately. If, it seems like, if anything, you would want more to deal with the increased load. Um, another reaction is just, you know, there's been a few bad apples, right? That uh, most of these certificate authorities are doing okay, and there's just a few people that are, are spoiling the whole deal for everybody else. But then again, I think if you look closely, uh, there's not really anybody in this game that doesn't have dirt on their hands. I mean, even VeriSign, when they were the only game in town, at the same time that they, you know, had a business as a certificate authority, they also had another section of their business, which was running so-called lawful intercept services for governments. You know, the same people that we'd entrusted to secure our communication were making money by intercepting secure communication. So, you know, I don't think if you, I think if you look closely, there's not, there's not really anybody here that, um, that uh, is doing a great job. Another uh, reaction that people have is that it's a scoping issue. Uh, that the problem is that everybody's in the same scope. So two certificate authorities right now are the Department of Homeland Security and the state of China. Um, and you know, there's been some talk about, well, if they just existed in different scopes and the DHS could only sign certificates for sites in the United States and China could only sign certificates for sites in China, then you know, problem solved. Um, and you know, while that might be an improvement, I feel like it's also kind of a low bar. Uh, that I think there are plenty of people in China who probably don't trust the state of China to certify sites within China, just as I feel like there are probably people in the United States that don't trust the Department of Homeland Security to certify sites in the United States. So to really you know, succinctly define this problem, I think it's useful to look back at this question. What happened to Komodo? You know, after all this, couldn't have been worse. You know? Well, nothing happened to them, but why? Why is it that nothing happened? What could we have done? I mean, right now, if I decide that I don't trust Komodo, and I don't, um, what can I do? Well, the best thing that I can do is remove Komodo from my trust database, remove them from my list of trusted certificate authorities in my web browser. The problem is that if I do that, somewhere between a quarter and the fifth of the internet 
disappears. That it just breaks, you know, that all of these sites that were signed by Komodo um, no longer exist. I can't connect to them securely. And sure, I could take an ideological stance to never visit any of these sites again, uh, you know, because they're part of the Komodo cartel or whatever. Uh, but, you know, really there's no appropriate response. And I think the important thing to remember is that this is as true for browser vendors as it is for you or me. Uh, browser vendors are in the same situation. They, you know, if, if they decide to remove Komodo from their trust database, they're just breaking a quarter and a fifth, a, somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of the internet for all of their users. The truth is that somewhere along the line, we made a decision to trust Komodo. And now we are locked into trusting them forever. And I think this is the essence of the problem, that I think we can, we can boil down all of the problems that we've been having with authenticity and certificate authorities to a single missing property, and I call that property trust agility. Trust agility has two main components. Um, the first is that a trust decision can be easily revised at any time, that if I make a decision to trust someone like Komodo, at any moment, I can untrust them. And now, there are a lot of people that say, oh, Moxie, you don't trust anybody, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that's not true. Today, there's any number of organizations that I could identify for me that I would trust. But what seems insane is to think that I could identify or organization or a set of organizations that I would sign up to trust not just now, but forever, regardless of whether they continue to warrant my trust or not, without any incentive to continue behaving trustworthily. The second important point is that individual users can decide where to anchor their trust. This is the same thing as saying individual web browsers or individual clients can decide where to anchor their trust. Um, you know, looking at this uh, scoping issue, right, some people say, okay, the problem is VeriSign and Komodo, they're in the same scope. If we would just, you know, separate the scopes, then everything would be fine because if Facebook does something particularly egregious that, or I'm sorry, if VeriSign does something particularly egregious, then Facebook could make the decision to switch to another certificate authority and it would actually matter because VeriSign would not be able to continue signing certificates for Facebook, which is the situation today. But, you know, I gotta tell you, if it's been a struggle to even get people to deploy HTTPS to begin with, to even support SSL, it seems a little like a stretch that these sites and services are going to be really actively making decisions in all of our best interests. Um, you know, what's more, in this increasingly globalized world, it also seems un a little unrealistic for one person, like a site administrator, to make a single trust decision for everybody. Because people, you know, have different, different sense of threat, different context, you know, they trust different people, they're up against different things, and really it's our data. You know, it's, it's us that's taking the risk by transmitting this over the internet, it should be us that make the decision about who we trust. Now, this second point, that individuals can decide where to anchor their trust, is really a simple but powerful inversion from the existing model. Right now, you know, there's three main uh, entities involved in uh, any kind of transaction here. There's the site you're connecting to, the user, and the authority. And in the existing model, the way that um, this uh, trust relationship starts is with the site. The site contacts an authority and says, please certify me. They initiate this transaction and the authority responds and eventually the certificate makes it to you through the site itself. And what I'm proposing is just a simple inversion, which is that instead of the authority, or I'm sorry, instead of the site initiating this trust relationship, it's the user that initiates the trust relationship, contacts an authority and says, hey, please certify this site for me. The, the, the reason that this is so powerful is because now it means the user can decide which authority they want to interact with. Um, which means that the scoping issue isn't so much of an issue, you know, that uh, it doesn't matter if the Department of Homeland Security can continue to sign uh, certificates for Chinese sites because Chinese users will just ignore it and talk to China. Or maybe they decide they don't trust China either and they talk to some NGO or something instead. Now, I think that these two properties um, are the essence of what's missing from our existing system and that if we can implement these going forward, we'll have something that's much more powerful and that will never leave us in the same situation again. Now, I want to take a few minutes to talk about DNSSEC, because there's been a lot of talk about leveraging DNSSEC uh, to replace um, the authenticity piece of SSL. And the basic gist is that what we're going to do is we're going to take our SSL certificates and we're just going to shove them in our DNS records. Um, it's more complicated than that, but that's 
That's the basic thing. So then the way it'll work is if I'm a web browser and I go to do a DNS lookup for the server that I want to connect to, uh, not only do I get back an IP address, but I also get back the SSL certificate of uh, the server that I'm eventually going to connect to. That way, when I actually make the connection to the server and get a certificate, I just compare it with what I saw in my DNS record. And if they're the same, then everything's good. Um, and I know that uh, this thing that came back in the SSL, uh, I'm sorry, that came back in the DNS record hasn't been tampered with because it's signed using DNSSEC. And we can trust DNSSEC. Now, I feel like there's, you know, when people hear about this, there's a really almost immediately visceral appeal to leveraging DNS in this way. You know, it just seems so nice, right? Like, you take your certificate, put it in your DNS record, bam, you know? And I feel like one of the reasons that it's so appealing is because people tend to mentally associate the word distributed with DNS in their mind. And that sounds like exactly what we need, you know? After suffering under the centralized yoke of certificate authorities for all of these years, we could just wipe them off the page and replace them with a distributed system instead. The problem is that when you start to look at it carefully, um, it's the information that's distributed in DNS. You know, the information in the DNS records is distributed across the zones of the internet. But the trust is still highly centralized. And in fact, this is exactly the way it works in the DNS system, or in the CA system today. The information, the certificates, are distributed across the internet on the web servers of the various sites that you get a certificate from. And the trust is highly centralized in the CA system and the certificate authorities. Um, so then you start to think, OK, well, um, if it's uh, not a distributed system, maybe there's something about the trust relationships that um, are more appealing. Maybe there's some trust agility in there somewhere. Maybe the organizations that we have to trust are uh, more reputable organizations. So uh, if we look at it, there are three main classes of entities that we have to trust in DNSSEC. Uh, the first is the registrars. Now, uh, if you think that CAs are sketchy, I think the registrars take it up a notch. Uh, these are organizations that were never designed with security in mind that are just a little bit shady. I mean, honestly, I, I think that it should be laughable that the current first step in deploying DNSSEC is to create an account with GoDaddy. <laughs> the second class of organizations that we have to trust are the top-level domains. Uh, so these are the um, companies and organizations that are managing the top-level domain zones. Uh, in the case of .com, uh, the largest uh, top-level domain, uh, that organization is VeriSign. Same player, same game. If you look at the other uh, TLDs, uh, like .org and .net, um, the organizations that manage them are probably not organizations that you have ever heard of. Uh, certainly, I wouldn't imagine that when, if you were asked, like, who do you really trust in this world? Who do you think is reputable? Uh, that I don't think these organizations would be at the top of your list. Um, take a minute to do some research into the organizations that maintain these top-level domains. Look at the people who are on the executive board. Look at the people that are in the operations uh, or managing operations for these organizations. Are these the people that you want to tr uh, trust with your secu secure communications? And then there's the country code TLDs. Do all of the people who use hip domains like .io, .cc, and .ly trust the governments behind those domains to certify all of their secure communication? What about TLDs like .ir and .cn? Should citizens in these countries, uh, visiting sites within their countries, uh, have to trust their governments with their secure communication? Uh, we, we had this map of um, the EFF's SSL observatory data on what countries um, are currently uh, capable of intercepting secure communication under the CA system. Under DNSSEC, it would look like this. And I think if the recent domain seizures are any indication of the future, um, the TLDs could continue to be trouble. And the final organization that we have to trust in here is the root, uh, which in this case is ICANN, uh, which I have no real complaints about. But I would say that while ICANN has made great steps to and efforts to become like a global organization, um, as far as I know, I could be wrong, as far as I know, fundamentally they're a California 501c3 nonprofit, which as far as I know means that they are subject to US laws. Um, and if any of the recent legislation that people have been trying to pass in the U.S. government, like COICA or Protect IP, you know, I feel like the, the lesson that we should learn from this stuff is not like whether it passes or doesn't pass, because you know, people have been going, going through a, a lot of effort to stop this legislation. But I think the thing that we should take away from it is that they're trying. 
They're trying to pass legislation that messes with this stuff. And one day they might succeed. Um, and so the worst part about these organizations, or the, you know, these classes of organizations, is that they actually provide reduced trust agility. That right now, as unrealistic as it might be, I could still choose to remove VeriSign from my list of trusted root certificate authorities. Uh, but there's nothing that I can do to st change the fact that they are the company that manages the .com TLD. Um, so if we sign up to trust these organizations, we're signing up not to trust them just now, but forever, regardless of whether they should continue to warrant our trust or not, without any incentive to, con to continue warranting our trust. So let's take some time to talk about things that I'm a little bit more inspired by. Um, the first is um, a project called Perspectives, uh, which was something that came out of Carnegie Mellon University, was de developed by Dan Winlent, David Anderson, and Adrian Perig. Um, Perspectives was a paper uh, that was published on using multipath probing for authenticity um, with SSH and SSL. And fundamentally, it's about the concept of network perspective. The, the basic idea is this. You want to connect to a website. So you make a connection to a website, and you get a certificate back. Now, here's the big question. Is the certificate valid or not? So what do you do? You contact an authority, and you say, hey, what certificate do you see for this website? And the authority makes a connection to the website, gets a certificate back, just like any client, and then forwards it back to you. And you just check and make sure the two certificates that you got, both from the website and from the authority, are the same. And what you're doing is you're using a different network perspective to see if you can get the same result. Now, we call these, these authorities notaries. And you don't have to talk to just one of them. You can talk to any number of notaries. And these notaries can be distributed around the world uh, with different routes to the same destination. You're essentially building a constellation of trust. And this idea of using perspective is not new. Uh, this is actually how the internet works today. Uh, right now, a site administrator says, I want to certify my website, paypal.com. And so what does he do? He contacts an authority, VeriSign. And what does VeriSign do? VeriSign sends an email to the site with a verification code in it. And if a site administrator can retrieve the email and uh, present the verification code, then VeriSign will issue the certificate. So the network perspective is already how it works. All we're doing is talking about inverting the relationship so that it's user initiated. So it's the user, not the site administrator, that is initiating this trust relationship with an authority. Now, perspectives came, uh, when the paper came out, uh, it also included an impl implementation. But the implementation was a little bit limited because it was initially designed for self-signed certificates. The idea was uh, it was a Firefox add-on, and it was just supposed to uh, eliminate self-signed certificate warnings in your browser. So it was kind of a proof of concept, and uh, it came with a, few, a number of limitations. Uh, the first was completeness. Um, perspectives only worked for the initial connection that your web browser made to a server. It didn't work for any of the background content, the images, the CSS, the JavaScript, all that stuff. Um, and so if you installed perspectives, um, it wasn't possible to eliminate certificate authorities entirely in your web browser uh, because you still needed them for all that background stuff and it was just authenticating this first connection. The second problem is privacy. Um, if every time you make a connection to a, uh, a web server and get back a certificate and then contact a notary, you're essentially leaking your entire browsing history to some third party, some notary, which seems unfortunate. Um, and then the last problem was responsiveness. Uh, there's this issue of uh, notary lag. The way the perspectives worked was you would connect to a site, get a certificate back, and then you'd connect to some other, uh, to the notary, or some set of notaries, and say, hey, what certificate do you see for this site? Now, the notary uh, would keep a cache of certificates that it had seen for that site. That way, it didn't have to make a new connection every single time someone talked to it. Um, and then after, you know, the notary was responsible for then making periodic connections to the site to make sure that the site had not changed certificates. Um, the problem was that if a site did change certificates, your results from the notary were going to be invalid uh, in between the poll interval. So there was this issue of notary lag, which caused real problems. So what I've done is I've taken this concept of perspectives and I've uh, built on this to be a more comprehensive solution. And it's, uh, the, the piece of software that I have uh, is called Convergence. And Convergence is a new protocol, a new climate implementation, and a new server imp implementation. The first thing that Convergence does is address all of these challenges. Uh, first of all, we, we've eliminated notary lag. 
Uh, so now, whenever you contact a notary, you say, hey, what do you see for PayPal.com? By the way, this is what I saw. That way, the notary only needs to connect back out to PayPal in the case of a cash miss or cash mismatch, and you don't have this issue of the, the notary having to continually pull the server uh, and uh, leave you in this lagging situation. The second thing we did was ad address privacy. Um, so that's the first thing we did there was implement local caching on the browser side. So what happens now is uh, your web browser get a, gets a certificate back from a site. It connects to a notary and says, hey, what do you think of the certificate? If the notary says, hey, this is A-OK, -okay, then you take that certificate and you cache it locally. That, time the next, that way, the next time you have to connect to the site, you get a certificate back. If it's the same thing in your cache, you don't have to talk to anybody. So now you're only talking to notaries on the first time you see a certificate or if a, if a site changes their certificate. So that's the only time you're leaking your browsing history. But still, that seems a little bit unfortunate that you leak your browsing history in those situations as well. So uh, the next thing we did was implement notary bouncing. So the way this works is you have a set of notaries configured. These are the people that you trust in the world. And you identify, you randomly pick one of them in the set. You want to talk to all of them. You randomly pick one of them, and you assign them as a notary bounce. Then you make a connection to the notary and do SSL all the way through the notary to the end entities. Uh, this way, the thing that's proxying your traffic can't see it because it's just a blind one-hot proxy, uh, and it can't, read, uh, can't get through the SSL connection. Uh, and so the notaries that you're talking to know the site you're asking about, but they don't know who you are. The bounce notary knows who you are, but he doesn't know what sites you're asking about. So this way, in order to reveal your browsing history, two notaries would have to actually collude with each other, which I think is a much higher and acceptable bar. Um, Convergence is a Firefox add-on uh, on the client side, and uh, it looks just like, you know, normal. Uh, the only difference is that in the top right-hand corner here, you get this little button, this Convergence button. And if you click the button, you have removed yourself from the CA system. Uh, you, your browser will now ignore all certificate authority certificates. As you browse through the web, everything looks the same. Uh, the only difference is that you know, if you go up here, normally uh, if you connect to a site and you mouse over the tooltip, uh, you mouse over the favicon, the tooltip that comes up will show you the certificate authority that has verified the site. The only difference, everything looks the same, is that we've taken the certificate authority out of the picture entirely. And so now it's the convergence system that authenticates the sites you're connecting to. Um, the notary implementation is designed to be extensible. Uh, so what we've done is um, change the protocol to be a nice uh, RESTful API. So the idea is that um, you can do whatever you want on the notary backend. Uh, right now, the notary works by default by doing this network perspective thing. Um, but really, you could do whatever you wanted on the backend, and the server is designed to be modul modular such that you can plug in different uh, authentication mechanisms. If you really like DNSSEC, you could have your notary do DNSSEC. Uh, if you really like CA signatures for some reason, you could set up a notary that validates CA signatures. Um, you could even do you know, other crazy stuff. Uh, you could write a notary that is a front end to, for instance, the EFF's SSL observatory, and the EFF has volunteered to write and run just this. Um, and you know, when you're configuring your notaries in the, in the browser, uh, you could have a set of notaries configured. Each one does a different thing. Um, you know, you talk to a set of notaries, one uses a network perspective, the other uses DNSSEC, the other uses CA signatures, the other is an SSL observatory front end. And on the client side, you can configure the trust threshold that you're interested in. Uh, so the default is majority. You can pump it up all the way to consensus if you want. And uh, what this means is that whereas in the existing CA system, if one of these actors turns into a bad actor, you're pretty much out of luck. It's game over, right? But in the conversion system, it means that all of your notaries have to be bad. That the more you have, essentially, the harder it is for everyone to collude in order to uh, intercept your communication. And it provides trust agility. If for some reason you don't like one of these backend systems, uh, or you don't, the, you, the notary does something that's particularly uh, egregious or no longer trustworthy, you can just remove them. And you're no worse for it. Nothing breaks. Everything's the same. And if you want, you decide you trust somebody else, you replace them with a a different notary that uses the same backend or a different backend that just happens to have uh, different practices. 
Other nice things about this system is that uh, the servers do nothing. Like if you're running a website and you have SSL installed, you don't have to do anything, no changes, which means that we don't have to migrate the entire internet to another authenticity system. Everything just works. And while this is a Firefox add-on, um, if the four major browsers were to implement this, uh, you know, bake it into the browser themselves, that would be it. That would be the end of the CA system, and we'd be done. Um, some other nice things are there's no more self-signed certificate warnings. Uh, that concept just doesn't really exist in the uh, convergence system. That if you have a certificate on your web server, it's good enough for convergence. Um, there's some problems. Uh, the uh, most immediate problem is what's known as the Citibank problem. If you are using Convergence and you visit Citibank, you will get a certificate warning. Uh, and it's because apparently Citibank has like 100 different SSL certificates. Uh, they have all these different SSL accelerators and each one has a different SSL cer certificate embedded in it. So the network perspective thing doesn't really work out. Um, you know, your notaries contact Citibank and they all see different certificates and you contact Citibank and you see a different certificate and it looks identical to the man in the middle case. Um, so um, the good news is that there really aren't many sites like this on the internet. Um, I haven't actually found anything other than Citibank that does this, the same thing. I'm sure that they're out there. Um, and so, you know, it might require some people to change their practices uh, to do something a little bit more sane than have 100 different SSL certificates. Um, but I, I don't think that that's a tremendous amount to ask. Um, the other immediate problem is captive portals. Um, you know, if you're at a hotel or you're, you know, in an airport or something like that, sometimes you'll get on wireless and you'll, you'll hit this captive portal where you, they want you to type in your credit card number before they open up access to the internet. And, um, you know, the problem is that you can't talk to the notaries on the internet because you can't get to the internet because it's a captive portal. Um, and, but the good news is that they let DNS out normally, and so uh, we just need to build uh, the convergence protocol onto the DNS transport layer, and we can talk to the notaries that way and solve that problem. Okay, so bear with me. I've always wanted to do this. I'm going to pull some Steve Jobs shit here and launch this on stage. All right. You can now go to convergence.io and uh, download this for free today, install in your web browser, and uh, be done with certificate authorities. Um, even if you're not into convergence or you don't want to run this, um, I want to leave you with one big question at the end of this talk, uh, which is that if anybody is proposing an authenticity system, if anybody is trying to convince you to use a, a different trust system, I think the first question you should ask is, who do I have to trust and for how long? Uh, if the answer is a prescribed set of people forever, proceed with caution. Uh, in the meantime, try out convergence. Thanks. <laughs>